please keep in mind that it's going to be very personal and um, each decision is only as good until the next one you have to make. So um, there's no real final decision. You're probably going to continue to have to evaluate your options as you go. So a little bit about me, like she said, I graduated from Ohio University, it seems like a lifetime ago, and my career has been spent um, helping people care for their loved ones, helping seniors figure out um, how to get their rehab and get back home, and trying to see what's the best environment for them to live in. And I'm currently a caregiver for um, two folks that are living at home, one's 92 and the other one's 72. Um, so I understand from that side of things too, just how challenging it is to try and manage that whole process. So what are we gonna talk about this afternoon? Um, first, we need to do an assessment and we're gonna talk about what is it that your loved one needs? So if you have a piece of paper and a pen, now would be a good time to grab that because you might wanna um, keep some notes as we go along so you can kind of assess where you're at. And then we're going to look at what are some of the options that we have to keep our people at home? What are some supports that we can have come into their environment that will help keep them safe and help keep, um, keep them at home as long as possible? That's always the goal. When that's no longer possible, we'll discuss what are some of the options. Um, if you haven't been to a senior living community in, in a while, um, it's a whole different world. You can see some lovely communities where people are vibrant and alive and having um, new friends and things to do. Um, it's not just what you think of when you think of a nursing home anymore. And then we're gonna talk about some tips um, when it comes to making an actual decision, what should we do? Here are some tips and, and tricks to hopefully help, help you decide where you wanna go next. So here's our first big question. I guess if you were going to have a test today, this would be it. Um, take a deep breath and think about what are the kind of things that your loved one actually needs your help to do? Um, this can be anything from um, shopping, going to the doctor. What are all those things that you um, are helping your loved ones do right now? So I'm going to invite you to take 60 seconds, um, and for most people that are caregivers, that's not going to be enough time, but just start writing down all of those things that you are currently doing um, to help your loved one. So I'm going to go ahead and, and let you take about a minute um, to think about or to think about and write down all of the things that you're doing to help your loved one. All right, the time is on. Let's go. Okay, so there are some different categories of things that we do to, to help our loved ones stay independent at home. Um, usually it starts with um, maybe one or two days a week. You might have um, going over to help your loved one have meals. You might be arranging for um, transportation. Um, as things progress and people become further along in their aging and in their um, disease processes, sometimes everything needs help. So there's some basic things that if you're talking about um, someone in a healthcare center, we talk about activities of daily living. You might hear, hear these called ADLs. So these are all of those things that a person needs to do just to be a person. So bathing. Does your loved one need help getting in and out of the shower? Do they maybe need reminders that it's time to take a, a shower? Um, dressing. So if we're looking at someone who has dementia, maybe um, when you first start providing assistance, they might just need help picking out their clothes. As things progress along that journey, um, it could be that you'll come over and you'll see that um, maybe your mom's wearing two or three nightgowns. The clothes might be inside out. Maybe um, 
the clothes are on for multiple days. You might go in on Monday and come back on Thursday and she's wearing the same outfit. So she needs some assistance stressing. As that the disease progresses, it may get to the point where um, you physically are having to put their clothes on for them. They're no longer able to independently even um, pick out what they wanna wear or put that on. Toileting is a big issue. Sometimes this can be um, as simple as installing grab bars in the home so that they can stand up off of a toilet um, or raise toilet seats so that they have more mobility. Um, sometimes as things progress, the person needs to wear um, Depends or some other kind of an adult product or incontinence of bowel and bladder. So it can be anywhere along this line. When we're looking at what are the kind of things that we're doing to help our loved one, um, self-feeding. Now, this is everything from, does the person know that they're hungry? Can they go to the um, refrigerator and get food? To the point where they're no longer able to physically pick up that fork or spoon and feed themselves. Um, functional mobility. Is your loved one able to get around in their home? Um, sometimes what we look at are safety things in the home, are there throw rugs, are there um, things that might impede their ability to safely move around. We might need to remove some furniture, we might need to get rid of coffee tables, um, just to support their functional mobility. Are they able to get from one room to the other? Are they safe within their home? And finally, personal hygiene and grooming kind of takes in that bathing and toileting. Um, is the person aware of their self hygiene? Are there odors? Um, are they willing to take a bath? Do they need assistance? Sometimes um, we're just not able to lift our hand up so that we can put a brush through our hair. So maybe your mom used to always wear her makeup every day and look beautiful and you come over and you start to see that things aren't quite as um, perfect as they used to be. Those can be warning signs that we're gonna need to step in and do some more things. Um, so those are activities of daily living. As we're going along, I invite you to write down some of the things that you're doing if they trigger you so you can get kind of a list. We're going to look at um, when is it time to get more help in and the things that you're doing for your loved one really indicate when it's time to get some more help in. Executive functioning. So the part of our brain that is decision making um, can be affected by sometimes medication, sometimes illness, sometimes um, dementia, memory loss. So when you're looking at the things that you do for your, your loved one, um, are you having to pay their bills? Are you trying to help them make good decisions? Um, are they able to make and keep appointments? Or are you now making the appointments and making sure that they have transportation to get to the appointment? Working memory, um, that just means can they remember enough information to make decisions? Do they know kind of what's going on? Do they know what day it is, what year it is, what time it is? Problem solving. When we start to think about, is this person safe to be at home alone or safe to be in the home? Um, if there were a fire in the home, would they know what to do? If they were cooking and they walked away from the stove and it caught on fire, would they know how to turn off the gas or um, would they be able to call 911 to get help? Can they problem solve those daily living skills so that they're safe at home? Medication can be a big one. Uh, many people used to just pick up the prescription from the pharmacy as things progress. Um, they find that they need to pick up the prescriptions and then put them in the little pill container so that their loved one knows what day the container, what day they're supposed to take their medicine and whether or not they took it. Um, sometimes um, as things progress, you're going to notice that maybe you physically have to administer the medication. And that's a warning sign that maybe they're not really um, safe to be at home anymore. They need some more assistance. 
household management. Um, this can be a hard one physically, lawn care. Um, are they able to manage the lawn care or from an executive function standpoint, um, do you have to arrange for someone to do it or do it yourself? Um, are they able to shovel the snow, keep the driveway clear, um, or are they, do they know that they need to have someone come in and do it? Are their gutters clean? Um, are they able to take out the trash? Housekeeping, do you see more and more items that are out of place or um, things that aren't clean that always would have been clean before? Are you doing more than just kind of a, a weekly pickup? Are you needing to do daily things? Um, what are the things you're doing for housekeeping? Um, laundry, laundry can be an issue, um, especially because many people have laundry that's not on the ground floor. So downstairs laundry is great if you're 35 or 45, but when you start to be 65, 75, walking up and down stairs with baskets full of laundry, it's not a safe thing for many people to do. Um, the dishes, are the dishes clean when they've been washed? They just pile up in the sink. Is it a hygiene issue where um, there might be food in the sink that could attract bugs or flies? Um, or are the dishes being done and being put away? Um, and grocery shopping, is your loved one, depending on you to do all the grocery shopping, um, are they able to manage that after they get the food home? Um, are you buying more TV dinners, cooking more, doing meals on wheels, those kind of things. So now we kind of have a list. So take a look and you can see where you're at. Are you doing support services? maybe for a few hours a week, or um, has it gotten to the point where you are overwhelmed trying to care for a loved one at home by yourself? Um, are you feeling stressed out? Are you no longer able to be the, the wife or the husband or the daughter, and now you're just in full caregiver mode? Um, it's very easy to slip into that. And I like to say that when we start, it's kind of like juggling one ball, that you just have one thing you're helping with, and then you throw in another, and you throw in another, and you throw in another. Um, it's a very slow process. So before you know it, you're trying to provide eight hours of care a day, 10 hours of care a day, 12 hours of care a day, and your entire world becomes focused on keeping that loved one independent. Um, when you look at the list of all the things that you're doing for them, it can be difficult to really acknowledge the fact that they might not actually be independent anymore. They're dependent on you. Um, so there are many resources and providers out there who can help. And that's what we're gonna look at next. So as you look at that list of all the things that you're doing to help, let's see who is out there that could come in and provide you and your loved one some support. So some stay at home options. So what are some of the things that can come in to help you stay at home. Um, Non-medical home health. So when you look at non-medical home health, generally this is something that is paid for privately. Um, if you have some VA programs, we'll cover some non-medical home health. Um, if you have a Medicaid service, which it helps people who can't afford to pay all of their medical needs, then there can be some non-medical home health that comes in. What these folks do is the things that you yourself could do, but you just don't have time for. So they can come in and help your loved one with bathing, with dressing, meal preparation. They can do transportation to appointments. A lot of it is companionship, just so that your loved one isn't home alone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If it's a spouse and you're still trying to work, sometimes the non-medical folks can come in just to give you um, time to deal with the rest of the things that you do in your life. Um, they cannot administer medication. Um, they can give reminders. So if your loved one needs a reminder to take their pills, this person could do it. Um, they're not supposed to actually dispense medication. 
they cannot do physical therapy, occupational therapy, skilled nursing needs. The non-medical home health is kind of like that extra daughter, extra granddaughter, someone who can come in and provide support services that don't have to be ordered by a doctor. Skilled home health. Um, so if you're taking care of your loved one at home and it's getting difficult for them to get up and down from their chair, if there's been a fall, if there's any kind of pressure area, um, skilled home health service is generally covered by your medical insurance, your Medicare, your Medicare replacement. And this is a temporary person or team who are gonna come in and help get your function back up to where it's maximized. So they're gonna help make sure you have the right equipment. This gentleman has a walker. They're gonna make sure you have the right walker. They're gonna look at your home and see what they can do to keep you safe. There's a nurse that will come in and manage your overall care. They will um, look at occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy in the home to help keep you as independent as possible. So this is something that um, many people get a couple times a year, just kind of a tune up. The thing about having um, skilled home health care um, is that you need to not be mobile enough to be able to go down to the hospital and have therapy. So it has to be a trying effort, a taxing effort to get in and out of your house. And so for many of our folks, this is a wonderful benefit. They're not, um, they don't have to leave their home. Someone's gonna come in, look at their home, make sure they can get in and out of the home, up and down the stairs. This is a big thing for bathing and dressing and building up their strength so they can stay home as long as possible. Now, if you're living at home and you need even more services, adult daycare can be an option. So the people that I care for go to adult daycare one to two times a week. They call it the club. Some people call it work. Basically, it's a day program for seniors, many that have some cognitive impairment issues, um, to provide them support, to provide them with um, socialization, activities, and to provide the caregiver with respite or to time outside the home to get the other things done that they need to get done. Um, adult daycare can be paid for privately. Um, it can be paid for through the VA. Um, it can be paid for um, through Medicaid, again, which is um, a program to help folks who their financial needs exceed the costs, their, um, their financial needs exceed how much funds they have to pay for that. So adult daycare is a great option. Um, it kind of helps the person who you're caring for just get out, have a life of their own, um, be with people. It gives the, the caregiver a break. And it's just a wonderful service for um, many people. And it extends the amount of time that they can stay home because their caregivers have their time freed up um, for a couple of days a week. They also include transportation sometimes if you need someone to come pick your loved one up and take them. But it's definitely something to look into if you're finding that your entire time is being focused on caring for that loved one. Um, hospice care. So, Hospice care is a specialized care for people who are at the end of life. So these are folks who have a diagnosis from a physician of generally six months or less expected life. And hospice care can come into your home and provide services for your loved one to supplement the care that you're doing. Hospice care also goes into assisted living and nursing and independent living places. Um, they are not primary caregivers, but um, they can come in and help with pain management. They have many services that support you as a caregiver and your loved one. They huge resource for education and help you see um, ways that you can support your loved one throughout the end of life process. 
Um, most people don't go on hospice soon enough um, because it's really hard to face our own mortality, the mortality of our loved ones. Um, hospice care can be a wonderful benefit for you and your family. Um, again, it's covered by Medicare, most insurances, and it's a supplemental care. So it's not going to replace you. It's just going to give you some more hands, eyes, and ears. So what are some of the warning signs that staying at home um, isn't going to work out anymore, that you've done what you can um, for years often, three to five years is usually the time frame um, that you're in there. What are some of the warning signs that it, it's time to look for a community or an institution? Um, the number one warning sign is wandering. So many folks who have um, dementia or cognitive impairment are physically pretty strong. And so you might find that your loved one is leaving in the middle of the night. Um, with my grandma, she was always packing her suitcase to go catch the, the train. And she lived with us for years and we lived in the middle of nowhere. So we were able to redirect her um, and let her know, hey, grandma, this, you know, I know you want to catch the train. Let's just stay here. Um, when she got outside, that's when the warning signs go off. If your loved one has been brought home by the police because they were wandering on the street, if your loved one has had a fall outside, but you didn't even know they were out there, um, it can be a sign that it, it's time to look for an alternative placement. If you're no longer secure in the fact that you can leave the house and come back and they're there, they're gonna be there. That's when it's time to think about, is it time for a move? Um, now there are different options for tracking devices and like the I've fallen pendants that you can get. Some of them are GPS monitors. Um, but if you don't know that your person is safe enough to stay where you left them, then their cognitive skills and ability to remain safe at home with those executive functioning skills are often compromised as well. So if there were a fire, if someone tried to break in the home, if there were things that were happening, they may not be able to deal with that. Another sign it's time to leave home are increased falls. So, they may not tell you that they fell. They may be able to get back up, but you need to look for signs of, you know, are there bruises? Are there is skin knees? Is there anything broken? Um, monitor that pretty closely. When you move into a facility or community, you still could fall, but there are gonna be people there to find you. You're not gonna be in your bathtub for a week or two, not, with no one finding you. Um, are you experiencing increased demands on your time? So did it used to be that you were able to kind of have your own personal life and still care for your loved one? Now you can't really go out and do the things that you need to do. Maybe um, instead of coming over two days a week. Now you're going four times a day, seven days a week because you just can't leave them alone. You're gonna see that um, your stress level is gonna increase and your ability to, to feel like that person is safe when you're not there or when you're asleep or when some, you're in the shower even. Um, if your time demands are going up and up and up and you can't meet them any longer, that's a big warning sign that it's time to consider a move. Next is increased confusion. Um, have you noticed that, um, that your loved one may not be recognizing you? They might be um, increasingly confused about the day and the time and the place and where they're at. Many times they'll start to think that they're at the home address where they grew up. Is the confusion increasing? So if you don't feel like um, the person is safe anymore at home, if you're worried about 
their ability to navigate in case of an emergency, it might be time to consider um, the next step. So what comes next? When staying with at home with services is not enough. The first kind of gateway into senior living, um, our independent living apartment. Um, so the person doesn't have 24 hour monitoring or supervision, but often these independent living apartments are in a complex where there are other people in the same age range. There are activities that go on. So there's just more socialization. Usually there's a pendant system where if they would have a fall in their apartment, they could push a button and someone would come and check on them. Um, a big part of independent living includes the meals. So if the primary concern is that your loved one isn't able to cook or eat without your assistance, independent living apartments can be wonderful. Usually they include um, two to three meals, depending on what you need. There's people around, you can generally um, add on services to the point where maybe someone would be coming in. You can add home health care. So this is kind of the first step. The person's pretty with it, but um, needs some extra support and services. Next is assisted living. So assisted living um, can be anything from a room to an apartment. And there's someone around 24 hours a day, seven days a week in case they needed something. Food is included. Usually there's transportation to and from medical appointments. There are nurses to make sure the medication is given, someone to assist in the bathroom, someone to assist in the shower, all of those activities of daily living that we talked about in the beginning. Your assisted living is gonna be there to assist you with that part of your living. Um, the other good thing is there's activities and programs and things for your loved one to do so that they're not just sitting in their recliner all day. There are people around, there's life, there's things going on. So this can be great socially and it's a great medical model support just to make sure that they're getting their medications on time and there's someone monitoring what's going on. Memory care. So you can have memory care in a nursing home, or you can have memory care in an assisted living. What memory care is, it's a special level of care for folks who have usually a dementia or Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. And the concern is that they might wander off. So in that case where um, the gentleman's walking his dog at two o'clock in the morning and gets lost, you can't Feel like your loved one is safe. They won't leave the house without you knowing about it. Memory care provides a secure environment. So what that means is that the person cannot just walk out the door without an alarm going off, without something alerting the staff that this person is trying to leave. The environment is also set up in a memory care to support the person at the level that they're at. So you're gonna find people with all different levels of function. Some people are able to still feed themselves. Some people may need physical assistance with, with um, actually feeding them. Um, what you're gonna see in a memory care are a lot of supports and structures built in so that each person can function at their highest level, but there's also someone there to provide support. Um, and again, memory care can be done in a nursing home or in an assisted living. Um, it just depends on the individual and what's gonna meet their needs and their um, family's needs. So what is a nursing home or a long-term care community? So a nursing home, um, a person in a nursing home needs more medical support. They might have more complicated disease processes going on. They need more monitoring. Um, than someone in an assisted living. Many times um, it's an issue of payment. So nursing homes um, generally accept Medicaid as a form of payment. And so many people um, don't have enough personal funds to pay six to $8,000, $10,000 a month to live in an assisted living. And so um, 
they need that level of care where someone is by their side um, in that environment, monitoring them um, daily, helping with bathing and dressing and all of those things. Um, and so it sometimes is a payment issue, but it's also a care issue. How much care does the person need? Do they need to be lifted with a Hoyer lift, which is a machine that helps lift a person in and out of bed? Um, what kind of things do they need support with? A rehab or skilled nursing home. Um, oftentimes after your loved one's been in the hospital or you've been in the hospital, you're weak, you need some um, aggressive therapy, you need someone who can help um, get you back to the level you were before. So rehab and, and skilled nursing homes, these are short stays. So you might go in for three days, 10 days, two weeks, um, your insurance generally covers it, and then you are discharged either home to an assisted living or to a just traditional nursing home care. The thing about a skilled nursing home, you need to have a service that only a licensed professional can do. So you and I couldn't give our moms therapy. We have to have an actual licensed physical therapist do that. So if they just need support standing, we could do that at home or we could do that in a nursing home. If they need actual physical therapy, then that's gonna happen at a skilled nursing home. And then when they go home with their home health benefit. That's a lot, isn't it? Sometimes just the number of choices that we have for long-term care can be overwhelming. So how do you choose? How do you decide which option is gonna work? Um, you can talk to a trusted advisor. Um, so the company that I work for, Best Approach Consulting, we sit down with families and we help you do an assessment and see where is it that our loved one could have their needs met, um, both their psychological needs, their physical needs, their financial needs, what is going to meet what we need and what we can afford and where we want this environment to be. Um, so we're a good resource um, for people. It could be um, an attorney is going to be your trusted advisor. It could be your physician is your trusted advisor. Um, the thing about us, we have time. It's a free service for you. Um, but get some advice. Talk to those people that know your loved one and that know you. Talk to your family. Um, don't make any rash decisions, but really get an idea. Um, if your person um, has a case manager through their insurance, um, talk to them about the things that you can do. If your person is at the VA and has veterans benefits, there's many things they can do to help support you. Find out what's available for your specific situation because it does vary greatly. Do a complete assessment of your loved one's care needs. This is where I talked about um, it 60 seconds not really being nearly enough time to truly think about all the things that you are doing for your loved one. Do a complete assessment, write down everything that they need help with, be brutally honest, and this is gonna help you figure out what is the first step, and what's the next step. Do a realistic assessment of your personal abilities and available time as a caregiver. Um, many of us have a life outside of the caregiving relationship. We have jobs, we have um, responsibilities to our children, our spouses, our grandchildren. Realistically think about how much time you have. And if this is becoming a question, then it's probably time to really look at who you can bring in. If you're starting to think this is too much, caregiver stress is a real thing and it can be detrimental to you and the person who you're caring for. So do an assessment of all the things that they need and then do another assessment of what you personally can do and how much time you have to do it. Next, look at your team. Um, who else can help? Uh, are there any family members who could do more or be more supportive? Are there people who have been asking you what they can do to help and you're saying, oh, we're good, we're good. It's time to open up and let those people in. Um, let them know that you might like 
Did you just come over for dinner one day a week? Did you mow the yard? Did you help me go through all those Christmas decorations in the attic this year so we can look at possibly downsizing? So take a look at the people you have around you, those people who are supporting you, and think about who can help you expand your role as a caregiver um, so that you're not trying to do everything yourself. Talk with an elder law attorney about paperwork. There are things, powers of attorney for healthcare that give you the authority to help make health-related decisions if your loved one cannot. Um, there's a living will, which is something that says, here's what I'd like you to do if I can't make a decision. And then there's power of attorney for finances. So these are all very, very important documents that you should talk to an actual elder law attorney about. Um, there are very specific laws that govern what they need to say and how they need to say it so that when the time comes and your person is no longer able to do things cognitively for themselves, you'll have the paperwork in place. Um, they can look at your finances and what you need to do to make sure that each spouse in the home um, is equally protected and help you figure out how you're gonna pay for care. Next, um, look at what available funding sources you have and what are the financial resources. This goes hand in hand with talking to the attorney. Um, again, there may be options that you have to help pay for services and people to come in your home. Um, the VA, covers quite a bit for the veterans who are covered under that. There are pensions and things available for people that need home care for spouses and for the veterans. So um, if you have a loved one who is in the service and they were in during a wartime, there are additional benefits for them. So take a look and see how can we pay for this? And again, that's where you talk to that trusted advisor as well. And do you have the financial resources to pay independently for home care? Do you need to talk to someone about Medicaid? So figure out how can we pay for this? Next, make an informed decision about what services you need right now. Um, is it someone in the afternoon every day? Is it someone to help with bathing and showering? What are the things that you absolutely need help with right now? that are gonna be able to keep your loved one home as long as possible. So prioritize those things. What are the things we could use right now? For some people, it's the thing we could do first is to keep them safe by talking to their doctor about in-home skilled nursing services. That's a, something that's covered under your Medicare benefit. They can come in and kind of point you in the right direction for safety things and help that person be as functional as possible. So maybe they'll need less help after their services. Create a plan. And that plan needs to include your timeline. So it can also say, my plan, make a plan by September 1st. That's part of the plan. Um, look at getting additional home care by July 30th, the next doctor's visit, whatever it is, investigate home health care. Talk to a trusted advisor. Just get that in your timeline because these things tend to happen a lot sooner than we think. Um, be prepared, unfortunately, for detours for your plans to be changed as health conditions change and decline. Many times we see people who are all ready to move into an independent living. Everything is set up, they're ready to go and then they have a fall, and then they have to go to a nursing home and a hospital and rehab, so things get detoured. Um, think about what your overall goal is, which is usually um, the health and safety of our loved one, and that we can spend time with them um, in a meaningful way. So what are your top priorities and understand things might change? Tips and tricks. So, now you have a list of all the things that you're helping your loved one with. Um, you have a list of all the 
the things that you can do physically and you have a list of things that you no longer can do that you need additional help with. You've talked to a trusted advisor, you're starting to make a plan, um, here's some tricks. Do not try to do everything by yourself. Don't try to do everything at once. Um, be open to help. Um, there are options, there are services that you might not even be aware of. Don't just assume that you can't afford it or that um, you have to keep trying to do everything yourself. Open up and let other people help. Be realistic about current and future needs. Unfortunately, um, it's a time in our life where we're not going to improve a whole lot. So as we're progressing through um, diseases like Alzheimer's or um, if there's been a stroke, be realistic that usually the needs are not going to be less in the future. They're going to be more. Don't feel guilty. Um, the worst thing that that you can do is to promise a loved one that you're never going to put them into a nursing home, um, that you're never going to have anyone else care for them but you. It can be um, hugely devastating to a family member. Please don't do that to your own kids and your own family. Um, they will do the best they can. You just have to do the best you can um, and don't feel guilty that you can't do all this. When your person moves into a community, there'll be 10 or 12 people that are taking over the job that you are doing now by yourself. So you'll have therapists, you'll have nurses, you'll have caregivers, you'll have activities. There's a lot of people involved in the care of someone. So do not feel guilty that you cannot do it all yourself. Prepare earlier than you think will be necessary. If you are on this, you probably need to start preparing now. Maybe we should have prepared six months ago. It happens really quickly. In an instant, you can have a urinary tract infection, get confused, end up in a nursing home or assisted living very, very quickly. So prepare earlier than you think because it just seems like there's never enough time. Be careful when you're doing online research. Um, <clears throat> it's really easy to go online in the middle of the night and type in a name of a, a community and assisted living. Um, be careful that you're actually on the website for that and not just an intermediary. There are places that look like you're going on the website for the place you want information about. It can be a clearinghouse and you type in your information and you start to get bombarded with solicitation phone calls from nursing homes and assisted livings and people who are trying to answer your questions and support you. Be very careful before you give your contact information to anyone online. Um, they will share that with people. Look at the fine print. Um, it's really important that um, that trusted advisor comes in to kind of give you a, a direction to point before you get online and get put into a system where you're gonna have a difficult time just getting off of that constant sales call cycle. Be honest about your own limitations. Be very, very honest. Um, it doesn't seem like that much to go over two or three times a week. And before you know it, you're going four times a day. Can you really do that for an unlimited amount of time? Be honest with yourself. Make time for self-care. Make sure that you're not lost in this process. As a caregiver, it's important to understand that um, if you are not around, who's going to take care of them? So please take care of yourself. 